All right, so we're joined today um, by Dr. Nick Watkins. Nick is a theoretical physicist who's done a lot of work over the years on complex systems, nonlinear phenomena, long-tailed phenomena. Um, he has a BSc from the University College of London and a DPhil from uh, Sussex University, University of Sussex, both in physics. And he currently um, is Senior Research Fellow um, at the University of Warwick, Center for Fusion Space and Astrophysics. He's also Visiting Professor at the Center for the Analysis of Time Series at LSE, London School of Economics, and also Visiting Professor in the Department of Engineering and Innovation of uh, the Open University at UK. So, uh, Nick, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, to get us started, um, You've done research on a lot of different things over the years, but a, a recurring theme seems to be um, nonlinear processes with long tail distributions, um, anomalous statistics, and I'm wondering sort of what draws you to that to that work. What do you find interesting or fun about it? Yeah, well, we it's 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 um it's a long story really, but we 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 got interested in the mid '90s, um, and it it was originally coming out of um, physical. Um, considerations that we were working on um, space plasmas yeah. and lab plasmas. So this was my colleague Sandra Chapman and Richard Dendy, respectively. And both these uh, plasma systems were actually re releasing energy in a very bursty way. And there was a prediction that we were all beginning to get really quite interested in from a, a relatively new at that time theory called self-organized criticality that was predicting heavy tails and power laws. So it really was at that stage, um, physics and, and a prediction that, that was energizing us. This is ironic in view of sometimes, you know, so the, the image that the field, you know, <laughs> sometimes has of a, of a problem looking for a solution. I think right, in our right. case, it really was connecting to something we wanted to know. But I think, I think my, interests have changed over time, I think, really. Um, yep. Um, so what is it? So in, in, in the class we've talked, I've talked a little bit in general terms about long tails. And I've yeah. said, you know, they're really different than Gaussian processes, exponential processes, and um, makes us think about risk and extreme events differently. And I've sort of left it at that. So I'm sort of wondering what what is it? How, how do you think about extreme events, long tails? Um, what is it that's noteworthy, important, um, interesting about those? I think what, one way you could put it, and I, I forget if you, this is a stolen phrase or not, but I, I, I like the idea of everyday extremes, the, the, the mm -hmm. fact that power laws produce um, what would be rare events in a Gaussian much yeah. more frequently. Uh, and this 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 kind of I, I, Taleb actually has a rather nice way of putting that he 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 calls them gray swans rather than black swans. Yep. So in, in his language, black swans are things that you wouldn't expect because you're using the wrong theory. Yeah. Whereas gray swans are things that if you only looked if you have a heavy tailed phenomenon and you use a suitably heavy tailed model, you will see these events in your model. Yep. Um, so. That's 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 one way of one thing to think about. One thing that I believe you've talked about a bit in your course, uh, which even back in the early '60s, um, Mandelbrot was trying to sensitize people to, was the way that the sample uh, behavior of such a system wildly varies. And in fact, he he himself used to use the phrase "wild" rather than "mild" for these fluctuations, mm -hmm. so that the sample mean would be all over the place, yep. and in many cases. Um, what what the, I mean, in some cases theoretically, well, in in many cases there's theoretically an infinite variance. In some cases there's even an infinite mean. Um, but one other nice um, way of thinking about this that goes back a very very long time is is what's known as the Pareto principle or the eighty twenty rule, uh, which is there's many many versions. One one which is quite popular in Germany where I am is that. I think 20% of the people drink 80% of the, of the beer. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think that's a, that's a facetious one, but it, it goes yeah. to the core of the that, idea. That might be true the, in the States yeah, as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, it might be a, a truly, it might be the one truly universal law in complexity <laughs> science, yeah. you know. But, yeah. but um, um, 
the, the, the more serious version of this is, for example, in insurance, which is 80% of the losses tend to come from 20% of the claims. Mm -hmm. And there are there, as I say, there are many, many versions of this. It, it, it found its way into quality control, for example, quite early in the 1940s. It's, it, it had, but the, the point about it is that to satisfy that kind of behavior, um, a power law will do it, but also quite a few other types of heavy tail distribution will do it. But the, the thing to really emphasize here is this is nothing to do with any particular theory about how you got those distributions. This is a much more in a sense, robust and old issue that many, many very practical people in, in insurance and many other fields have been wrestling with for the best part of the century. And it's, you'll sometimes get the feeling that, or you'll, you'll hear people with the sincere belief that power laws are a kind of affectation of, of modern physics and, and nobody was worried about them before then. And in fact, they're, they're a, it's, not, it's really not quite as simple as that. Heavy tales in the broader sense have been worrying some people for a surprisingly long time. Yep. Is there a is there a case you can think of where you know if you think of a problem if you don't realize you have a heavy I mean obviously in general if you don't realize you have a heavy tail and you do you're in big trouble. But I'm wondering if there's an example that stands out as particularly calamitous or illustrative in some way. I think um there are a few good natural standbys, as it were, that really are good examples. And one is the Gutenberg-Richter law for earthquakes. Yep. Um, that um, the the yield, I think, of earthquakes f falls off as a, as a power law. Yep. Um, now you have to be very careful, and I'm not a seismologist as to, as to what exactly the right units are of that quantity. Right. right. Um, the magnitude of solar flares is another remarkably wide band power law where if you if you weren't aware of that you 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 would be getting um the wrong numbers um but so, so our solar i think backing up just yeah. so solar flares which can if i'm not mistaken can cause uh you know these sort of like geomagnetic storms can mess with power grids and so on so it's not not the to, not to say it's merely space science, but it has very strong terrestrial implications. Oh, there's there's a genuine connection between solar flares and space weather. That's yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, and um, I think there are. I think the, the the other thing though that I think I would stress, and I I think it's a thing that I I've come to appreciate over many many years, and I hadn't I certainly wasn't aware of this when I started out, is that. Sometimes the question is not, is it a power law? Right. Sometimes the first level question is just, has it got a much more heavy tail than I'm um, used to? And um, what the shape of that tail then is might be something that you have to worry about down the road. But the, the first thing you really want to worry about is just, you know, is, the, is this a heavy or a light tail? The, o the other thing that I think is worth mentioning um, is that, because it's, it's a bit non-intuitive, is um, sometimes even a tail like an exponential, even though it's not heavy, yeah. produces a lot more rare events than your intuition sure. is expecting. Yep. Yep. So and then so so it's a kind of halfway house between the Gaussian, you know, school that we went to, as it right. were, and right. the, the heavy tails. And and that that's something that's been stressed in turbulence and condensed matter and various other fields. And it's something that certainly for somebody like me who was not aware of that at the beginning, um, it's something that's really worth remembering, I think. Yep, absolutely. Uh, because it's not always that easy to tell these things apart if you've got rather narrow band data. Right. And, and I mean, so, yeah, and that's something we've covered in the course. We, you know, we've looked at the um, Closet Chalese Newman paper in some detail, and yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. cautionary lesson for all of us who like to do log log yeah. fits, right? It's not. It's not it, it was. It was, of course. I. I mean, the thing is, it, it was. It was fine, but I think who said that. The other thing to do is not to fool yourself, and, and you're always the easiest person to fool. Right. And of course, he wasn't. He wasn't accepting himself from that advice. You right. know, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, that's always a good basic attitude to take. I, you know, absolutely. It doesn't help. You know, at least if you're aware of it. Right. Yeah. Yep. No, for sure. So, um, so here's a question I can sort of ask a couple of folks. So, how would you finish this sentence? Most power laws in nature are.
How would I finish that sentence? Um, and, and you could reject the sentence, and you know, most power laws aren't anything, or. So I, I've sort of been thinking of this in the, so, con in the context. That's a very good question, but I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't have a very well, good answer. Well, no, I mean, I actually think that, that, that long pause is a, is a great answer because like, that's sort of how, how I might answer it as well. I mean, it, yeah. so, you know, most power laws. I, I can tell you things I wouldn't. I yeah, mean, exactly. I, I, right. I, so I think. I, 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 I wouldn't say most powers in nature, power laws in nature are boring. Okay. Because, because, um, I think at the bare minimum, they tell you something about um, the fluctuations in your system that you might want to care about. If, if they're an amplitude distribution yep. and if they're a waiting time distribution, they tell you something about uh, what Mandelbrot would call slow fluctuations as opposed to fast ones in white noise. So, you know, they usually have some concern to you. Yep. Uh, I would also, however, not so they're all an, they're, they're all a symptom of self-organized criticality because that's also not true. Sure, yeah. So some of what you might call the two, um, you know, in some sense, extreme views. Right. I, I think right. neither of those are, are there. They usually a clue. Um, they use, sometimes they're a clue to some interesting physics. Sometimes they're just uh, an invitation to be explained or, you know, paid attention to. Um, I don't think they are, um, you know, they're, they're not a, a panacea for anything, but they're, they're, um, they've led me down some interesting paths. I, yeah. I, I don't feel, you know, I, I don't feel great regret that I got interested in <laughs> yep. the subject, but, but I, but I would say that uh, I would, I would encourage all of your students to read Bax's um, "How Nature Works" as a, as a, as a fascinating book. You know, a great bit of scientific writing, but um, they may well experience the feeling that many of us have felt that, you know, while you're reading it, you think you're, you're being vouchsafed some tremendous revelation about the world. And then after a, while, after a while, you think, hang on a minute, you know, and then you, you spend the next 20 years curious about, you know, exactly where the limits of that, that worldview um, actually are. Yeah. But I mean, if you, if you view the purpose of science as in part provocation, and clearly yeah. some people do. Yeah. Um, then, then uh, you know, he, he achieved his ends, I think. You know. Yep, yep. No, I, I think, I mean, the I'm teaching a class on campus now in yeah. addition to the online one, and I think a point we often come back to in our discussions is that noting that something is a power law is an interesting starting point. Yeah. It doesn't, what you know, in and of itself reveal the essence, but it's, it's yeah. some powerful clues and something's interesting going on, and if the big things are avalanches or big payoffs those could be good or bad and noteworthy you'll want to pay attention to those um, yeah I think they, I, I would say I think perhaps I should have stressed also is that um, the one I think one of the terrible dangers in um, complexity science at its at its peak of arrogance which I think has, has come and gone I think it's a somewhat <laughs> so. more kind of yep. it's a somewhat That's... more um, you know uh, cautious enterprise now is is um, that um, You know, there, there tended to be an invitation to, to focus on a very small range of diagnostics and not worry about the prior knowledge that you bring with you and to yeah. distrust the prior knowledge. And I think hopefully people have now got a more balanced attitude and say your prior knowledge is at least as useful as anything else that you may have measured. Don't just don't distrust it. You might be biased. You might be wrong. Right. But if you happen to know quite a lot about the system that you're measuring, don't throw that away and just fixate on the power law. Exactly. Uh, and there are plenty of, of, of cautionary tales in the in the scientific literature which you can find on your own that, that will yep. confirm the, the merit of that. Yep. And I, 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 I think that, you know, in many branches of science, people don't need to be told that. I think it's, it's sometimes in physics we're looking for a certain kind of simplicity yep. that we yep. maybe forget this perhaps a bit faster than, say, an ecologist would, you know. Yep. I... As a physicist, I certainly think that's a fair statement. So, um, great. Are there any other comments or cautionary notes for the for the for the students? Um, I I I don't think so. I would encourage them. I think. I mean, you're already encouraging them to play with um, the Clausé codes. I think, and actually, I I. I 
I would also say that it's been a really, it's, it, I have been surprised to realize that, for example, the generalized Pareto distribution, which is quite widely used in extreme statistics and insurance and so forth, yeah. is available within MATLAB to play with. And you, so you can play with quite wide um, parameter ranges from that, yeah. uh, where in fact it shades all the way from um, uh, a power law over to an exponential. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the great, you know, one of the great um, advantages that students have today that was still relatively not the case when I started out is the ability to just play with these machines. Obviously, there are distractions and so forth, and there are there are many other complications. But but um, you can do in an afternoon with MATLAB things that would have taken us months. So you know, I, I do do play. I think yep. is, is is one of my messages. And um, uh, yeah. Um, but I think if if you if you regard it, it you know if you if you don't regard it as a panacea but just as an interesting thing, there's still a lot of um, there's still a lot of interesting things to find out. I'd also say, um, I think I'm, as you know, Dave, I, I'm acquiring a historical um, uh, obsession. But I think I think it, it do, do if you can get at the early papers every now and again, just go and read the early papers because it's always interesting to see how people introduced an idea yep. and I think sometimes ideas actually get distorted or bits bits are forgotten the, the process of science is not as linear as people would have you believe yep. and there are things that might have been known 50 years ago that, that in some can then get forgotten and I, I feel like it's non-linear also my like my own so it's non-linear in terms of the culture of science but also just my understanding there's you know sometimes yeah, I'll read a paper absolutely. and I'm like whatever, that's some old thing, it's annoying. And then five or ten years later, I understand things differently, and I come back and I was like, oh, that's what he was saying, or that's what she meant. I didn't get it. So, uh, yeah, there's, yeah, there's definitely a value to, to revisiting um, yes. to revisiting those things. Yes. I agree. Okay. Great. Well, um, thank you very much for sharing thoughts with us. Um, My pleasure. And, um, yeah, thanks again, and we'll be in touch. Okay. Right, take care. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.